I am stuck sharing the same bed with my crush for the rest of my high school. Part 1. The following story contains mentions of domestic abuse. Please listen with caution. At the age of 12, I decided to run away from my home. Obviously, kids from bad families end up in bad situations all the time. Nothing new about it. And since I was not the first kid to witness my parents being horrible to each other, I assumed that I definitely was not the first kid to run away from my home either. Antoine Doinel had done that, why couldn't I? I know that wasn't solid reasoning, Antoine was a fictional character after all, but are these fictional characters not a product of society? I know I am a product of society, even though I want to be anything but. So at the ripe age of 12, I decided I would run away from my home, and so I did. I hid in the little park just 15 minutes away from my school and some 45 minutes away from my home. I had nothing to eat, so I was crying by the time the clock hit 6. Even then, I was determined not to return home. I spent an hour sleeping in the bush I was hidden in until I heard quite a rustle that I knew did not happen because of a human. I removed myself from there and ended up stumbling right into a lanky kid. And it was Andrew, my future best friend and crush. Throughout my time out of the safety of the school, I had met several creepy adults, so it was a welcome relief for a kid seemingly of my age, to take an interest in me. He asked me where my parents were, and when I didn't answer, he grabbed my arm and coaxed me into bringing me to his parents. After that failed attempt at running away from my parents, I was returned home several hours later. Even so, I couldn't forget the warm embrace of Andrew's parents. I knew I wanted to be in their lives, so I decided to cope with troubles at home. And that was how I was here, five years later, next to Andrew. You don't have to end up like your mom, you know. Andrew tells me and sticks a cigarette in his mouth. I hush at him, remind him that we're still on the school grounds, and he grins back at me. I will stop smoking the moment I turn 18. Don't worry, we are nearly adults. But still not adults, I tell him and lean against the wall. I don't want to end up like either of them. I continue as if I haven't already said this thing a million times by now, and as if Andrew hasn't already heard that a million times by now. If I ended up like either of them, just shoot me, alright? What are cops there for anyway? Andrew narrows his eyes on me. You have already given up on the police. I shrug at him. Shouldn't I? When I become a cop, Andrew says and turns to me, his thin frame hovering over me in a way that nearly reminds me of many, many movie stars doing the same to their lovers. And I flush in shame, eager to put that thought away for the rest of the... day. I will not give you a single reason to doubt the police. Several hurried footsteps rush in our direction and I cannot help but grin as Andrew quickly stubs the cigarette under his shoe and dusts his clothes off. I hope so Andrew, because the irony isn't lost on me at all. I tell him and giggle some more as he grabs my hand and drags me away from that horrible horrible place. We stop right in front of the school grounds, still waiting for the last bell to ring. Ten more minutes and we will be out of here. As Andrew leans against the tree, I cannot help but look outside the school grounds at the rowdy college students standing on the other side of the road. One in particular catches my eye, and I do not know if I catch his eye or not, but Andrew pulls me in a side hug, his warm breath hitting my bare neck and reminding me of all the reasons I try to stay away from him, and tells me, I hope you know you can pull better than that. And I grin at him. I hope so too. Will you come see the night at my place? Andrew asks and grabs both of our bags in his hand. I fractured mine, over something a few days earlier, so I'm basically useless right now. Uh, is that alright? Andrew looks at me as if I have grown a second head. Why shouldn't it be? I shrug at him. I will be there. Andrew grins at me and drags me along with himself, whispering nonsense as the college student, whom I've had my eyes on, shouts something behind me. Andrew and I have become best friends, even though we met some 4 or 5 years ago. But in all these years, we have seen a lot, so I'm not very surprised that we have come so close. And how we met is interesting as well. Although I do feel embarrassed each time at the thought of recollecting that part. I cannot help but feel glad that I did that. I feel glad that my parents fought that day, that my dad picked up a bat and hit me with it so much that day before I didn't even want to see his face because if not for those moments, I wouldn't have met Andrew. As bad as the circumstances sound, I really, truly am glad. A few days later. Of course, that also means that I passionately feel for Andrew. 
even if our conversations often remind me of where I belong. We are at Andrew's place, and he had just cleaned off my newest wounds. Thankfully, his parents aren't home yet, so I don't have to worry about them badgering me to just ask for their help. They have been doing that for years, and after one particular incident, I have kind of started avoiding them at length. Now, whenever I meet them, I tell them that it's alright at home. Not good, but not entirely bad either. But I cannot do the same when it comes to Andrew. Sometimes, he does not even need to see if I was hurt physically to know that something happened at home. And probably that's why I feel so passionately about him. You know, right, cops are just one call away. Andrew comments, sitting next to me and staring at me as if I haven't already heard that one in the longest time. My mom doesn't want that, I tell him. She's grown comfortable with the circumstances, and besides, I stop and shrug. It's not like it happens every day. Andrew rightfully looks outraged, though he controls his emotions. Do you even know what you sound like, Cooper? I couldn't care less. I tell him again, shrug and then drop on his bed. Besides, we have nowhere else to go if that happens. That house is his. You can always stay here with us, your mom and you. Easy for you to say. I mutter and suck on my bottom lip when he sucks in a breath. Anyways, let's not ruin our night. You were telling me something. Andrew looks like changing the topic is the last thing he wants to do, but he follows my suggestion anyway. We are both tired, and I'm pretty sure no one wants to go through the sob story all over again. Over and over again for the ninth time now. I was watching something, and I couldn't help but think that I want to be a cop so bad, I might even die if I don't become one. The same old story. I grin at him. Andrew scowls at me and then lies closer to me. I will be able to help you. Why do you want to help me so much? Because you're my best friend, he tells me, his eyes shining brightly as he looks right at me. And because no one should go through what you two are going through, even if that is wishful thinking. Cooper, he says and then stops after taking a long breath. You must know how helpless I feel about this. And right then, I know I have a massive crush on him. I feel the same. I tell him and then turn to my side. Good night, Andrew. Will you not eat? Mom left something for us. I'm not hungry. I just want to sleep. A few days later. Of course, I know my feelings for Andrew will bring nothing but trouble. For starters, Andrew is my best friend. And I'm not going to threaten our friendship when I don't even know what I feel for him is genuine or a helpless want for a safe space away from my abusive household. I am not going to threaten anything about us when I'm not even sure of that. Secondly, Andrew has never given any hint to me about him being anything but straight. His last relationship was with an older girl, and although they broke up within months, Andrew still gushes to me about having the best time of his life with her. Although, I admit that I do feel that he doesn't sound as confident when he makes such claims. During those moments, his voice stutters and he acts like he hasn't ever touched a girl before. And while those moments give me hope, I cannot deny the fact that he has dated three girls in the last year alone. I would be stupid to do that. So what do I do when I know I cannot make it with Andrew? I try to find someone else who can be with me. And that's how I came across Tate, the same college student I noticed a week or so ago outside of the school grounds. On Friday of the upcoming week, when Andrew is busy with our homeroom teacher over discussions about the latest assignment, he is still standing outside of the school, a cigarette between his fingers just like Andrew has. The familiarity of that act makes me feel... comfortable, somehow. How old are you? Tate asks when he comes to me. Soon going to be 18, I tell him, craning to look over his taller frame. Tate grins and extends his hand towards me. I am Tate. I take his hand and cannot help but draw similarities between his hand and my dad's. I'm Cooper. I study here. Nice, Cooper. Will you go out with me? I nod at him, charmed that such a handsome man has taken an interest in me. And he's older. Surely he knows the ways of the world better than I do. I give him my number and tell him that I'm going to meet him in the evening. Tate grins at me and then waves me away, his broad frame swallowed by the swarm of students leaving the school premises. I smile and think, I cannot wait to tell Andrew about this. A couple days later. Obviously, Andrew is not very pleased with the news. I told you the first day you can pull better than that guy. 
Tate. I tell him and then pull up Tate's Instagram. Look, he's cool and sexy. And older. Andrew adds with some disdain in his voice. There's no way he's younger than 22. He's a pedo. You're barely 17. We are not telling anyone about this. And I am past 17. I tell him. Doesn't change the fact that it's wrong. Andrew mutters and tries to focus on the class. He lasts some five minutes before he turns to me. You remember, right? We are going to the movies this weekend? Or have you made plans already? I stare at him guiltily, and he pursues his lips before turning around. A few days later. My first date with Tate goes... Well, at least in more ways than one. I was already late to it, given Andrew's less than enthusiastic efforts to send me away right into Lion's Den, as he liked to call Tate. But I told him that I was happy and hopeful that it would go well. And at that, Andrew sighed and patted my head like he always does. Just be careful. He told me before pushing a pepper spray in my tote bag. If he tries anything funny, tell him your best friend is a martial arts expert and he wouldn't take a minute to break all the bones in his body. You aren't a martial arts expert, I replied. Andrew grinned at me then. He doesn't know that. And while walking towards the cinema hall that Tate and I agreed upon, I cannot help but wonder if Andrew knows that he looks anything but physically active. Sure, he has God-given height at such a young age, and sure he has broad shoulders to match his lanky frame, but he is still your typical high schooler. And Tate, well, he looks like anything but a student. In all the days that Tate and I have flirted and talked over the phone, I have never felt like he is a student. He sounds more like your average man who's taken an oath to take nothing but himself seriously. I didn't think you'd come. Tate informs me and holds my hand before pulling me into the hall. You should know I was growing nervous as hell. Why wouldn't I come? You look handsome, by the way. Tate grins at me. Thanks, and so do you, kid. And that sets me off. Kid? Who calls their date kid if they don't want to sound creepy? I shuffle around the aisle as Tate tries to look for our seat, unsure if this was a good idea. Somehow, it is now that I feel the weight of our differences, age being the biggest factor. Even then, I stick with him in fear of upsetting him or worse. The movie starts soon, and I realize that Tate is a very twitchy person. His hands stick here sometimes, and sometimes there. Several times, I push him off me, and he grins at me with a soft, sorry, and then we return to the movie. And then instead of watching the stupid movie, I think how nice it would have been to have Andrew with me right now. I know he will make everything better. He will even perhaps swallow this imminent feeling of loneliness that I often feel nowadays. But until then, I try to cope with him. The next day. Please tell me nothing happened between you two. Andrew begs, walking up and down the room. If something did, I am informing an adult. I am sorry, Cooper, but this is something I will definitely do. Nothing happened, I tell him. You need to chill. He's my boyfriend. Things are going to happen someday. Yes, but not now. He insists and then pursues his lips. You know better. Oh, do I? I taunt him and then feel guilty about it. It's not his fault that I am unstable and seeking solace in the arms of a stranger. One who is at least five years older than me. If my parents heard this, they are surely going to make my life a living hell. I'm sorry. I tell him then. Andrew sighs and puts his head in my lap. It's alright. How about we get something? Pizza, is that alright? Or do you want burgers? Burgers alright. Andrew grins at me. I am ordering two for you, Cooper. You gotta eat. You're thin as hell. Thanks for telling me how I look. Over the course of the next few weeks, obviously, Tate keeps on proving Andrew right. He says and does things that I know shouldn't be done. In fear that Andrew may go batshit crazy, I decided to keep most of these things to myself. Until one day. I have only recently told Andrew that Tate and I often kiss now, and he did not look very amused by that information. In fact, he looked positively furious. I do not understand it. He tells me. Why can't you date someone of our age? I found him first. I shrug at him. Cooper, how old is he? He asks me. I shrug again, only now realizing how stupid it looks. I don't know. You don't know? You don't know how old your boyfriend is. Andrew throws his hands in the air. 
I must let someone know of this, Cooper. What if he tries to do something and I'm not there? Well, I'm not a helpless kid. I snap at him. I can protect myself. Andrew looks guilty at that. Of course you can. I'm not saying that you cannot, but... And then he says nothing else. In all honesty, it is probably because of me that he doesn't. I've been nothing but aloof to all of his gracious and logical statements. If anything bad happens to me tomorrow, I know it happened because of no one but myself. And then days after that realization, the first unforgivable thing happens. I'm at Tate's place, during one of our dates, and he has rolled in another movie. That's one thing that Tate does a lot. Watching movies, and so most of the time we do nothing but watch movies. It's something infuriating, but also nice, because then I do not have to worry about Tate getting handsy. Until today. Today, he does not look in any mood to actually focus on it, and his hands trail over me more than they usually do, even though he does not touch me inappropriately. Have you ever thought of going further? He asks. Further? Where? Tate grins at me as if he's amused by my reply. Taking the step forward. Doing more than just kissing. I shift next to him. I haven't thought of that. Now that's a lie. He replies and runs a hand through my hair. He hasn't done anything wrong, but I feel uncomfortable anyway. You have to know that point will come in our relationship someday too. Well, I don't want to do anything with you right now. So what's the point? Tate's smile drops. He clicks his tongue. Whatever, I'm not going to force you. That'd be a major turnoff. And though he said nothing of the sort again, he acted mean and distant for the rest of the night. When we fell asleep, he slept a little away from me and said goodnight in such a dispassionate tone that I wanted to do nothing but hit him right across his jaw. His meanness was getting through me, and I slept with tears sliding down my cheeks. The next day when Andrew asks me if something happened, I tell him everything. A few days later. Passive-aggressive kind of shit. Andrew mutters and snaps his laptop shut. He was searching through information about police academies and I was lying on his bed, doing absolutely nothing. It's been a few days since I told him about what happened with Tate, and he isn't any less angry than he was then. Your parents will freak out if they hear you cussing, I comment. Oh fuck that. I don't care about that. You tell me what you are going to do. I shrug at him, a response that seems to get on his nerves. Don't shrug at me, Cooper. You're not getting out of this. I'm not trying to, I tell him. You sound dismissive. It's my situation. I'm allowed to sound dismissive if I want to. In every other situation, you are allowed to do that, Cooper. Andrew sighs and I can see that little tilt in his head, the one that always indicates that he is extremely tired and needs sleep. But in this one, you cannot just shake your head at it and move on with your life. Your boy Tate sounds like a manipulative loser. He's ignoring you because you said that you are not ready for sex. Is that what a nice boyfriend is supposed to sound like? It's not that I consider him nice, I reply in a soft tone. Then why? Why are you with him? It's been weeks, Cooper. You know better than me that he isn't a good guy. Why are you wasting your time and energy on him? Because it's been weeks with him. I grab one of the pillows and put it on my chest. I've grown familiar with his presence. I've grown comfortable with the situation, and I know a little more time, I will be okay with it too. Adjustment requires time. I shrug at him. Andrew, for the longest minute, doesn't say anything at all. You've grown comfortable with an abusive relationship? He finally asks. I look at him and catch the same emotions in his eyes that I know I have in mine. It feels natural to be with him. I tell him. It's the same at home, with mom and dad, and it's the same with Tate. It's... normal. Even to my own ears, I sound stupid and irrational. Andrew shakes his head. I am not letting you meet him again. You're not my dad. I am your best friend. So act like a best friend and stop feeling jealous. Why would I be... Cooper, do you want me to feel jealous? I sniff at him and then move my face away. I do not have the courage to face him after that. Please don't say anything. Is there something I should know, Cooper? Andrew asks. Why are you with Tate? I know you don't love him. I know you don't like him either. Then why are you with him? The tears that threaten down my cheeks are right on the edge. 
Is there something that I should know? Andrew asks, and a dam bursts through. I love you, alright? I scream at him, something that I rarely do. Andrew looks stunned and stays rooted in his spot, looking at me with those wide, blue eyes of his. I love you, and I always wanted to run away from that damn house, from my damn parents. I needed a safe space, and you gave me that safe space. Then I fell in love with you like some loser, but I knew I couldn't tell you that because I didn't want to lose you. I need you in my life, Andrew. And is that why you decided to date Tate? I nod at him. He was a stranger, and I didn't need to tell him anything. I thought he'd be my boyfriend, and things would finally look good for us. But he constantly proves me wrong, and I don't know what to do about it. By now, I am crying. My face is beet red, and it's so warm. I may as well have a fever. And Andrew is still standing in front of me like a statue. That bit scares me more than anything else. What if he's upset? Maybe I should have kept my mouth shut. I have done it for so long, I could have done it longer. But the confession is out, and I'm not sure what to do about it. Or about Andrew's silence. Fearing the worst after 10 minutes of pin drop silence, I sniffle and get out of the bed. I better go home. I tell him. No, stay. Andrew says and grabs a hold of my wrist. Then, he goes silent once again, and I have no clue what is happening. Andrew? I'm sorry if I upset you. I didn't mean to put this on you. You haven't. He says, and there's a strained tone in the words. I am glad you told me how you feel because... I feel the same for you, Cooper. That stuns me so much that I cannot help but stare at him wide-eyed. What? Andrew nods at me. So foolish of us to fear for our friendship when we love each other in the same way. His eyes are bright and earnest, but I do not miss the little shakiness in his frame and words. I dismiss them, though, because Andrew never lies to me. He has never done that before, and I know he will never do that in the future. So, by that means, his confession is... real. Do you like me for real? I ask. Andrew nods at me. For real. He runs his free hand over my hair like he always does, and I melt in his touch. I'm so glad we know that now. We've wasted enough time not being close. And kissing. I tell him and then hug him. Andrew looks just a tad bit stiff when I press a kiss against his cheek, but I tell myself that it's probably because of his shy nature, even though he is anything but shy by nature. When I pull back to look at him, he gives me a grin. Cooper, break up with him, will you? I nod at him. I will. He smiles and then presses a familiar kiss on my forehead, a habit he picked up when we met each other for the first time, given my circumstances and our height difference. To feel that it hasn't changed even now feels so familiar that I cannot help but consider this a safe space too. A few days later, I inform Tate that I don't want to be with him the same night. He gives me angry replies at first and then finally ends the conversation with a small thumbs down before blocking me. When he does that, I show Andrew my phone, and he nods in approval with a small grin etched on his handsome face. I am glad he didn't give you any trouble. He isn't really like that. I tell him and put my phone away. He's just a little manipulative and a lot touchy. Andrew gives me a grim look. Sure, Cooper. That sounds like such a nice person. I give him a small smile and then drop myself halfway across his lap. Should we go out today? On our first date? We have to make it official, right? Andrew shifts on the bed, as if uncomfortable. A thought tugs at my heart, but I push it away in fear that I will not be able to deal with it right now. Not right now when my parents have freshly broken into another set of arguments. Am I heavy? I ask, trying to lighten the mood. Andrew snorts then, and I relax at the familiar expression on his face. You? Heavy? You're light as a feather. I roll my eyes at him. Oh come on, I'm not that light. Sure. Whatever helps you sleep at night, baby. A few days later, it's lunch break. Andrew and I are sitting in a secluded corner of the school with me draped halfway across his body. It's a nice feeling to be finally so close to him in ways that I've always wanted. It almost feels like I deserve it, this touch and this kindness. I finally feel happy, a fact that I often tell Andrew whenever I feel the happiest around him. My parents are talking about divorce again. I tell him and play with his fingers. 
They have been talking about divorce for four years now. Andrew blows the cigarette smoke away and then throws it away. If a teacher found him smoking, his parents are going to have a field day at the school. I wish they separate already, half of the problems will be resolved like that. But it isn't so easy, I tell him and then pull away from him to look into his eyes. I have always wanted to kiss you when you smoke, I confess. Andrew looks a little shocked and starts giggling. You said you hate the smell of it, he exclaims in mock delight. A furrow comes between my eyebrows, but I still want to kiss you. All right, he tells me, but does not move an inch. I decide to take matters into my own hands and move close to kiss him. At the last possible moment, however, Andrew pulls back with a small huff. I don't think now's the right time, and then points ahead somewhere. I do not turn to see what he's pointing at, but I feel doubtful anyway. How real was his confession to me? A few days later, things are getting saucy at my home. I informed Andrew earlier that day, can I live with you for a while? And Andrew had grinned at me and said, why not? But I now bet he is probably regretting that. Andrew's parents, Matthew and Cynthia, were worried when I walked into their home and informed them of the issues at home. They asked if they could help in any way. I told them that my mom had promised that she would take care of the issue now. I don't know what she means by that, I tell them, but I'm sure it will end soon. But now that it's past midnight and Andrew and I are still awake, I cannot help but wonder how much he hates the thought that I am in the same room as him. Earlier this morning, I had been daydreaming about kissing Andrew left and right, and now all seemed lost. You're always distant from me, I comment, tears in my eyes. You always act like you hate being around me, not when we are best friends, but whenever I make a move. I cannot even kiss you without you acting stiff and making stupid fucking excuses. So tell me, Andrew, do you love me? Are you even gay? For his part, Andrew only replies with a small, I'm trying, Cooper. What about the confession? Did you say that only because you hate Tate? Andrew swallows at that, and I cannot help but feel heartbroken because I know something's wrong. I'm sorry, he says, but I had to say that to save you from that asshole. That stuns me so much that I don't say anything for a while. Cooper? Andrew calls. You lied to me. I choke on my words. You told me you love me, but you were lying to me. You have never lied to me before, Andrew. So why did you lie about something this big? I had to save you. Keep that savior complex to yourself and fucking choke on it. I burst into tears after that and bury my face in my hands to not make any noise. Andrew's parents are sleeping and I did not want to face them right now. Cooper, you're my best friend. Andrew tells me. I couldn't see you spiraling down the same road as your parents. I had to do something. And you lied to me. I had no other option. You weren't listening. I shake my head and suck on my bottom lip. I'm going home. I'd rather live with my dad than stay here any longer. Andrew stands between the bedroom door and me. I'm not letting you go there. It's not safe there. And is it safe here? I see that him. Safer here than there, he replies. I tried to protect you. He continues and sounds so freaking sad that I walk away from him and sit down on the bed. I know I should have done it in some other way, but I couldn't think of anything at that time. I had to bring you away from him. You've broken my heart, I tell him. Andrew swallows and I see tears in his eyes. I know, and I'm sorry. Are you even gay, Andrew? Andrew shakes his head and I burst into tears again. The next day, I try to return to my home, but the situation at home is still so bad that it doesn't seem like a habitable place. My mom shouts at me that I should stay somewhere else right now because she's returning to her own mom's house for a while, and that she cannot take me with her because I had the last months of school still left. Dejected, I sit in the little park 45 minutes away from my house until late evening when Andrew's dad, Matthew, finds me there and brings me with him, the same day that Andrew did all those years ago. And that's how I ended up back in Andrew's bedroom and on his bed. I will move out the moment mom returns. Andrew sighs behind me. Okay, Cooper. Do you think heartbreak in a friendship hurts more than from a breakup? To be continued. I am stuck sharing the same bed with my crush for the rest of my high school. Part 2. Narrated by Andrew. Cooper left the moment we were done with our high school exams, and I haven't seen him since. 
and the guilt, like a pendulum, still weighs heavy on my conscience. But it isn't only the guilt that keeps me awake at night and makes it impossible to live through the rest of the day. It is the feelings, the dreams, and the daydreams that keep me on the edge all the damn time. Sometimes, I cannot help but wish I had better explain myself to Cooper, because it was the lack of explanation from my darn side that ended it all. I could have said, Hey Cooper, I'm not gay, but I'm not straight either. All those scores I kept with my girlfriends were blatant lies. Cooper in return would have asked, Then what are you? And I could have given a simple answer. Asexual, I think. I have yet to figure out a way around that one, Cooper. I need... patience. But I didn't do that. In fact, I didn't do anything. I didn't even freaking try, and the guilt of that weighs heavy on me. Now, all these years later after that fateful year, I haven't been in any relationship. Not because I do not have the time, but because I haven't found my right love again. Cooper does not want anything to do with me, and I have honestly no idea what's the point of falling in love then. I realized my feelings a little too late, and now I am shuffling through the awkward aftermath of losing the one true love. The only dream I could fulfill is joining the police academy, and we are on the last stage of it, just on the edge, about to be let loose into the world as the new police officers, fresh out of the oven and everything. But that doesn't mean the responsibilities do not lie heavy on our shoulders. All the corrupt ways of our seniors lie on our shoulders after all. From next week onwards, all of you new recruits will work under your seniors. You'll deal with real life cases. No more assignments, although these will be your assignments in some ways or the other. We were told just a few days ago, and all of us are now eager to know what seniors we are going to work under. But as the days draw close, I am more than anxious to meet mine. Because if the rumors around the academy are true, then I'm going to end up with Richie Johnson. An absolute hell of a man in both attitude and sheer arrogance. Oftentimes, they say he rolls his eyes so much that he may as well lose them someday. And when he is announced as my senior, I cannot help but roll my eyes. Given my bad luck in literally almost everything I do, I did see that one coming. Come with me, Richie tells me and pats my shoulder. We are going to the pub to celebrate your last day of freedom. I roll my shoulders and look straight into his eyes. I do not drink, sir. You should learn then. Be a man. I roll my eyes at him and then follow him to his car. Fifteen minutes later, we are at the pub. Twenty-five minutes after that, I am drunk out of my wits. Screw Richie. He brings me out of the pub and we sit outside its premises. And the night is still young and I still feel just as lonely. In fact, I feel lonelier than usual. Drinking really fucking sucks. Then Richie pats my shoulder and asks me what I am trying to achieve by being a cop. Do I have to answer that? I ask him, my words slurring against each other. I would appreciate an answer, he tells me. Okay, a lot then. I'm trying to do a lot. You can try to be specific. Don't give me that old civil service and all answers. I know that already. I need to hear your story. What was your reason? Nothing. I tell him again and then shrug at him. Wait, I think I have. I do have one. I nod at him then. You see, when I was 12, I met this kid. He was 12 too, and he had run away from his home. It was an absurd thing to me. I came from a loving family, so the thought that someone's parents could be so cruel to their own kids sounded like an alien concept to me. But he kept crying, and I couldn't help but wonder why the police didn't help his mom and him. Did they call the police? Richie asked. I shake my head at him. My dad did it because Ku, the kid, refused to return home. My dad promised that he'd call the police, and that little kid said that his dad would hate that so much. But even then, my dad called the police on him, but his mom refused to stand against his dad. I shrug at him. I am still not sure why his mom did that, but I have always guessed that she was just scared. Anyways, we became quick best friends, and I have not once backed down from the thought that I want to become a cop and make sure he doesn't have to go through that hell for the rest of his life. Richie slowly smiles at me. That sounds like a nice reason, kid. Where is he? This time, my movements are sluggish and I feel drunker than before. I don't know. I tell him, and feel horrified when I hear the slight break in my voice. I don't freaking know where he is, and it's killing me. He doesn't want to talk to me anymore because I did something stupid, and I don't know what to do. Richie pats my shoulder. You'll find him again, kid. 
I sniffle at him. I hope so, Richie. Richie raises an eyebrow at the slight slip, but doesn't say anything. The world is a small place. Where could he have gone anyway? A few days later. Nowhere. Cooper hasn't gone anywhere. Because the case Richie and I are assigned brings Cooper back into my life. Definitely not in the way that I hoped to see Cooper and his mom, Laura, again. And as I read through the case, I cannot but think with a scowl directed at myself that I am late once again. Always a freaking disappointment. Never have I truly helped Cooper. Sounds familiar? Richie asks and pats the folder on my table. It reminded me of your story, so I decided to pick this one. He wriggled his eyebrows. Until you find your best friend again, I think you can do a little bit of practice. Oh, Richie is a nice guy, all right. If you weren't so unaware of the trouble, I really would have said something mean to him. But now, I sigh at him. It's my best friend. I inform him with a straight face and put my head on the table. And it's messier than I remembered it to be. Richie's smile drops from his face. What? I'm sorry, Andrew. It's alright, sir. Maybe this was faded. I could still do something about it. Uh, exchange it with... I shake my head at him, effectively cutting him off. No, this sounds important. I want to be with Cooper for this one. Even if he probably doesn't want to see me, I tell myself. I want to make sure he comes alive from this one. The same evening. Cooper's dad, Aaron, is dead. Police suspect foul play, and Laura, Cooper's mom, is the prime suspect. Of course, I couldn't care less that Aaron is dead. That may never made it easy for either Laura nor for Cooper. But I still cannot help but feel intrigued at the idea that Cooper has taken the blame on himself and said that he, and not his mom, committed the murder. Everyone knows that's not the truth, but police proceedings have to be done anyway. Cooper hasn't done this. I tell Richie as I drive us to the new place Cooper and his parents lived in. I've never been to this part of the town, and I'm still not surprised to see the state of it. There's no way he has done this. Richie nods at me. We know that already. So why is he being questioned? Because he's creating unnecessary hurdles, Richie tells me. We have to clear that he hasn't had any kind of accomplice in the murder. But even if he has, Aaron deserved that. I have known that man for such a long time, and I don't even hold a bit of sympathy for that man. He's better dead. You have to learn to control your emotions, Andrew. I swallow. Sorry, sir. I understand your sentiments, but let's get done with this, shall we? He pats my shoulder. We know better than to work on beliefs. We need evidence. I nod at him and then follow him into Cooper's home. Sometime later. Obviously, Cooper isn't too pleased to see me, but I know I am. In the years following his absence, I always wondered what he looked like. Sure, my dreams created this particular adult version of his, but nothing could, and I mean it, compared to the actual thing. He is still shorter than me, but the baby fat on his face has disappeared, and his face has taken a more angular shape. But it's his shaggy hair that catches most of my attention, and how well kept both his face and hair are. When I notice the lip piercing on the corner of his mouth, I am overwhelmed with such an intense need to kiss him that it gives me a whiplash. The ringing in my ears ends only when I hear Richie's voice. Don't get me wrong, kid. Richie is telling Cooper, but I don't think it's in your power to overpower your own dad. You don't look like it. Cooper's lips curls up in distaste. He was drunk. He was not drunk. I interject, if only with the need to be involved in the conversation. More than that, I cannot help but want to talk to him. It's of utmost importance to me that I do. The... The... Uh... Report said so. My mom couldn't have done that either. She's smaller than me. Richie sighs. Your dad was killed in his sleep. Cooper's voice comes out more passionate than I expected to. Then why are you making the argument that I couldn't have done that? I've come forth, haven't I? Just arrest me. Put me behind the bars and be done with this case. It's not so easy, kid. Richie tells him and then stands up. The next time he speaks, his tone is stricter. Show me the room. When we come out of the room, Richie looks at me with a snort. That kid's your best friend? He's a liar. He's scared. I correct him. Richie nods. Unfortunately, it wouldn't help this case. Or his mom. I stop in front of our jeep. Can I stay here? Talk to him for a while, I mean? Richie shakes his head at me. 
I am afraid I cannot allow that, kid. It's in your best interest that you stay away from him until this is cleared. But he needs me, I tell him. Later, Andrew. Get in. A few days later. Of course, I did not heed Richie's warnings. In the last few days, five interviews have been conducted with both Lara and Cooper. For evidence, we found the knife that was used in the murder. In a few days, it will be proven, and I am afraid I will lose Cooper after that. So, with that fear in my head, I leave my home around 11 at night and drive to the place where Cooper lives. I try to feel less anxious than I feel, but when I finally knock at Cooper's door, I'm not sure if that trick is going to work. It takes a while for Cooper to open the door, and when he sees me, he stares at me. Why are you here? He asks. I wanted to talk to you. Immediately, Cooper moves to shut the door. I put my hand against the door before he can, and his glare has turned vicious. Andrew, get the hell out. Can we talk? Please. Unless it is for the case, I don't see why we should. I regret it, alright? I tell him and push a little against the door. I regret not explaining myself better. I regret everything, Cooper. I've missed you so much. Please, talk to me. Give me five minutes, that's all I need. Cooper clenches his jaw and looks like he wants to do nothing more than to punch me. And honestly, considering how guilty I feel, I will allow him to do that. Five minutes. He opens the door for me. Then I am kicking you out. For the first two minutes, I do not say anything. It's almost like I had forgotten every single thing I wanted to say. Looking at him right now, I may as well have. Cooper shifts on his feet. A nervous tick of his since his teen years. Well? I'm sorry for what happened. He nods at me. Everyone is. You're still beautiful, I tell him. Tears gather in Cooper's eyes then, and I feel guilty again. Andrew, please stop this. What do you want from me? Nothing, I promise. Just give me another chance, Cooper. Please. You hurt me. I should have better explained myself. I know. Cooper looks confused, but only slightly. Why did you say that? I'm not gay or straight, Cooper. Thanks for telling me. Cooper dryly murmurs. Your time's almost up. I love you, I tell him, and the silence that follows the confession is so loud that I cannot help but quickly realize how bad the timing is. I mean, you confess to me and what happens next? Cooper asks and said, I don't understand? Of course, you don't understand. His tone is deadpan. Now that it's someone else's problem. Cooper? I softly call out his name. Cooper shakes his head. Get out of here, Andrew. I am done with you. Before he shuts the door on my face, he says, And I am with Tate, so please keep all your feelings to yourself. They don't matter to me. A few days later, I know I have no right to roll over my bed over this fact. Cooper is a grown-up man. He can make his own decisions. But that still doesn't make it any easier on me. When Cooper broke up with him all those years ago, I thought he was safe now. After all, Tate was soon going to finish his college and leave the city. So I was absolutely sure. But even now that I know my assumption was wrong, I cannot help but think that I had seen it coming. Bad things happen to us all the time. What's another bad thing? Over the next few days, Cooper tries to avoid me each time he comes for an investigation. By now, the case has reached its peak, and in a few days, it will be announced. I know Cooper is on the edge, so I try to keep everything to myself. I cannot, after all, do anything to ruin the delicate relationship between us. But the moment comes anyway, and in the worst possible form. But moments before that, Cooper and I have a tiny interaction, and as our conversation flirts more and more towards one particular direction, I end up asking him, why are you still with Tate anyway? Cooper looks stunned for a moment and then his lips curl in mock distaste. This is the most hateful I have ever seen Cooper, and it breaks my heart when I realize that it's not directed at me, but himself. At that look, I cannot help but wonder how much part I played in that. I was looking for something familiar, he begins, and I ended up with Tate. And I cannot help but recall his words from ages ago when he'd mutter with slight disdain 
that he knew he would someday get comfortable with his situation with Tate, just as his mom had done decades ago. And now Richie is asking me to ruin even that bit of delicate interaction between us. Why can't you do it, sir? You and I know you can handle it better than me. I'm asking you to do it as my junior. And then, Richie removes himself from there and escapes into his own cabin. I glare at his back and then sigh when he disappears out of my view. I will now go and have to inform Cooper that his mom will be charged with a murder charge. Sometime later. Cooper, obviously, holds the disdain against me. He clicks his tongue and sets his jaw. Tears fill up his eyes and I know I'm on the verge of losing him again. Your mom, I continue shamelessly, will be put behind bars for now. The court hearings will be decided soon. We are assuming it will be held in two weeks. This is wrong and you know it. I hang my head low. I'm sorry, Cooper, but this is how the law functions. Don't give me that bullcrap! He shouts at me and the words ring loud in the mostly empty police station. I cringe a little, but I have nothing against Cooper. What he's saying is true, after all. We spent all of our lives under that man, and even dead, he hasn't left us. There's too much. On cue, a storm rages outside. I'm sorry, Cooper. Oh, you must do something, he says, his tone verging on begging. I cannot let my mom suffer any more than she already has. Dad deserved it. I hang my head low, and that should be an indication enough, but I still mutter a small sorry anyway. Even though Cooper doesn't need to hear that any more than he already has, I cannot help but utter it for the rest of the night that I spend with him, because we do spend the rest of the night together at least in some ways. When it starts raining soon after, I suggest to Cooper that he come with me. You can always return home in the morning when the weather's better. Cooper seems to think otherwise, but then something seems to come over him, and he agrees immediately. All right, in different rooms, he tells me. In different rooms, I promise. And despite that particular part of the conversation and its implications, Cooper initiates advances at me. They are, obviously, purely of sexual nature. But I soon realize that Cooper isn't doing that to placate our feelings, for it is a given thing that both of us are desperate for each other's touch after such a long time apart, but because of something else entirely. And when I push him away because it seems wrong, he breaks down into a loud sob, buries his face in his hands, and sits down on the sofa, his clothes askew. I try not to stare at his bare shoulders, but that is also a difficult task. How can you be so dismissive of me? He asks. I'm not dismissive of you, I tell him and shake my head at him. I'm sorry if I have ever made you feel like that, Cooper, but I'm not dismissive of you. Yet I feel so. He replies and for the next 10 minutes keeps crying. After that, I offer him napkins. His face is beat red and his eyes are so red-rimmed that it feels like he will break down into another set of tears soon. I try not to feel helpless at the reminder that I may have played a very big role in bringing Cooper to this position. I am sorry, he says finally. I am not like that. I mean, offering myself to others. He rubs his hands together. But I have grown so used to the idea of people wanting something in return for a favor that I didn't think twice before kissing you. I will never make you do anything of that kind, Cooper. Tate does. He replies with slight disdain in his voice. And he's my boyfriend. He's a white trash, that's what he is. I glower at the dining table. But you do not ever need to do this for anything, Cooper. But I really cannot help your mom here. She did murder him. If it was done in self-defense, then something could have happened. In a way, it is self-defense. He replies. I shake my head at him, and then he goes silent for the longest time. By now, he has stopped crying, and all I can hear are the little sniffles he lets out every now and then. Carefully, I maneuver myself on the sofa and make sure that there's enough space between both of us. I'm sorry, he says again. I shake my head at him. Don't be. It's just... I wish our first kiss had happened differently. And then, to myself, I whisper... That would have been really nice. A few days later, Cooper broke up with Tate soon after. Although we didn't exchange our new numbers, Cooper still managed to contact me with the help of none other than Richie. 
Your friend badgers a lot, Richie tells me. I tried to get him off me. Even with the threats, he didn't listen. Does he know how dangerous that is? I nod at him and pocket my phone. You were the one who kept us apart. It's ironic you brought us together, sir. Richie glares at me. Go to hell, kid. It's hot there. I smile at him and then give him the folder. Everything's done. You should check. He nods at me. After the lunch break, he promises. Later in the evening after my office hours are over, I find Cooper waiting for me, outside the police station's premises. I pocket my car keys and act like I have no way of going home. Hey, I call out to him. What are you doing here? I met mom, he tells me as if I don't already know that. They said I will not be able to meet her much after this. What am I going to do without her? Hey, I softly say and place a hand on my chest. Come on, breathe for me. I eventually inform him that I have a car with me, even though I wanted to lie to find more time to spend with him. But Cooper looks so distraught, I cannot lie to him. I bring him to a diner and ask him if he has eaten anything. I've been sitting out of the station since afternoon. Could even get up to find something to eat. It's alright. Come, tell me, what do you want to eat? Nothing too heavy, he replies. Sometime later. You know, being free from Tate again feels really good. I didn't know how much I despised him until I told him I didn't want anything to do with him. I grin at him and keep driving slow and smooth. The weather is cool and I want it to do wonders for us. No rush, we have rushed enough. Good. He started crying at some point. He mutters, sounding guilty, and you do not have to carry the burden of guilt. It's been a long time coming. Cooper shrugs and looks out of the window. The cool wind blows his shaggy hair here and there, and I cannot help but feel mesmerized by it. I sometimes wish things were a little more stable in my life. Started my life in a fucked up family, got beaten up every now and again, and now my mom killed my dad. God, it all sounds so funny. And if that wasn't enough, I got involved with a groomer and stuck to him like a sore loser. I cannot believe I went through all that. And you're still standing strong. I tell him and grab his hand with my free one. Am I? He asks and scoffs, playing with my fingers like he used to. When we come across a particularly silent area, I pull over my car. He turns to look at me. Do you want to meet anyone here? I shake my head at him. I'm sorry about what I did, Cooper. It's been years. He replies with a snort. Get over it. But it hurt you. He shrugs. It did, sure thing. But I'm not going to sit here and weep about it all the time, am I? After we left for that new home, I didn't even think we'd meet again. But here we are. Maybe we just misunderstood each other. A big time. We misunderstood each other a big time. I add. He nods at me. I'm sorry for pushing myself onto you. In your defense, I was a good liar. He scrunches his nose at me. For a while. For a while. I agree with a small grin and then I clean my throat. But I have long grown from the shell of that boy. What I now feel, Cooper, is as real as it can be. How long have you been feeling like it? Cooper asks softly. Soon after high school. The distance did me some wonders. I shrug at him. Cooper gives me a small and sudden laugh. I cannot help but follow along. Can I kiss you? He asks, and I'm not sure how early this is, but I lean over and kiss him on his mouth. Later, when Cooper spends the night at my place, I sit down next to the sofa he is lying in and tell him what really happened all those years ago. I was fond of him when the Tate situation happened. I felt jealous when he was staring at other guys, but... I did not love him just yet. That feeling grew over time, especially after he left. And by the end of it, he informs me that I am stupid. I tell him that I agree. A few days later. It's the hearing day, and we will know today how many years Laura will serve in jail for Aaron's murder. Cooper, just as I expected, is on the edge, and he keeps crying every now and then, feeling and acting like a kid soon to be left alone by his only surviving parent. And although I wish to console him and hug him, I cannot. I stand next to Richie as the court proceedings happen and steal several glances at Cooper throughout it. 
Cooper does not return it even once. When the final announcement is made, Cooper rushes out of the room. Lara is given 12 years in jail for second degree murder and without parole for the first four years. My heart breaks for her, and more when I put the handcuffs on her wrists and bring her to the van. How will I ever look into Cooper's eyes after this, I have absolutely no idea. I can only hope that he forgives me. For the next few days, I do not see Cooper. He does not return my calls or my messages. I know he's upset with me, and I decide to let him have his space. That's the least I can do. On the seventh day, he returns to my life. It's past 11, and I've just returned home from the station. It rained heavily earlier, so the weather is a little colder than usual. And as I'm staring ahead at nothing but the wall, the doorbell rings. Curiously, I look through the people and am shocked to find Cooper standing on the other side. I immediately open the door and find him shivering and underdressed. Cooper? I don't think I can handle it alone, he tells me. I tried to, but then it got very unbearable. I wanted to go meet Tate at some point, but I knew that was a very bad idea. So I have come here, Andrew. I need help. Lots of it. Hey, come here. I grab his arm, pull him into a hug, and close the door after him. It's alright. Do you want to have some tea? I can make us some tea. Cooper shakes his head against my chest. I just want to sleep. I'm tired. A flush works up my skin at the pain in his voice, but I bring him into my bedroom, offer him my own clothes, and then rush him into the bed. Hold on, I will switch on the heater. Do you need it? I don't know, he answers. I switch the heater on anyway and sit down on the sofa chair next to the bed. Are you hungry, Cooper? Should I bring something to eat? Will you come and lie down next to me? I sigh but do not deny him the touch that he needs. I lie down next to him and then sleep comes very easily to both of us. The next day. When I wake up the next day, Cooper is laying halfway across me and staring at me. Cooper? I ask groggily. Is everything alright? I cooked us breakfast, he replies. Oh, you didn't have to. We could have ordered something. I like cooking, though. Helps me with my stress a lot. Yes, I remember that little thing. Thanks, I tell him with a smile. Can we eat? I nod at him. Let me brush my teeth first. All right. Then he pulls away and I start craving him right away. A few days later. Of course, now that Cooper is living with me, it's easier to monitor his behavior and care for him. But living together, besides these things, is also bringing us together, sometimes. It's like we are back to the old days. It's not going to be very bad, I promise. I will keep checking on her. I run my hand through Cooper's hair and rub his head occasionally, delighting each time he lets out a tiny sigh. In recent times, this is the most relaxed he's been. Thank you, he tells me. I smile at him and rub my thumb over his eyebrow. You don't have to thank me. I still want to, he replies and puts his head on my chest. I am glad you are with me right now. He suddenly begins. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how else to deal with everything. I wish I'd never left. He smiles. At least you are here now. He cranes his neck to stare at me. That's all that matters, really. He adds when I look a little doubtful. I duck my head a little to press a kiss against his lips. I'm glad you're here. Then it's a mutual feeling. It is. I agree with a smile. A few days later... It takes me a little while to convince Cooper to even think about therapy, but when he says in a promising tone that he will think about it, I know we have won half of the battle. I talked to a therapist friend of mine to keep his tabs open for Cooper, something that I knew he may need sooner than later. Although Cooper has been showing signs that he's doing well, sometimes the fake hate slips, and I know that it will not end well. It's best that he talks to someone, even if it's not me. Cooper is feeding the fish in the fish tank when I arrive from work. Two days ago, he left home and then returned with this fish tank. Don't worry, I will take it away when I leave, he said. Why would you leave? I'd ask. You aren't sick of me yet? I've just got the chance to love you, Cooper. I think that's the last thing that would ever happen. And today, he is feeding them. The scene is way too homely, and I cannot help but melt at the sight of it. Hey, I say. Hi, Cooper replies and turns to me. An hour later and after we've had our dinner, 
Cooper tells me that he missed his old self a lot. He plays with my fingers and does not look me in the eye. I envy that young boy. Not the circumstances. I press a kiss against his cheek. I kinda miss myself too. Not more than I do? You miss my old self more than I do? I let out a laugh. How? Because I was your best friend, and because I was there. He grabs my fingers. You used to be handsome then. Ouch. I exclaim dramatically. Cooper grins at me. Thanks, he says against my lips. I catch his lips in a kiss. Thank you, Cooper. Conclusion. Cooper soon joins therapy sessions, and I am almost always present to bring him with me to our new shared home. We have started dating, and honestly, it seems like we will keep doing it for a while. Lara is... alright. Well, as alright as she can be in the current situation she is in. The end. Have you ever loved your best friend? Thanks for watching! Consider subscribing to become a part of our Rainbow Force, and also go and check out our Ko-Fi page. Stay wholesome!